Come on, clap your hands. I come to give you all I got, Father. I come to give you everything that I have. Yeah. When I move the toughest waters, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I move over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. What you do, you make a way with them. service. If you're sitting in your living room, I want to tell you that God made you a promise and his promise is yes and amen. Come on. I believe what you said. Can't help but sing. Come on. 
você. Promises are yes 
Then amen, Father.
Father, praise right there. Come on, let your living room get loud right there because he's a way maker, because he's a healer, and he will heal this land. In the name of Jesus, we just declare it. We speak that over your life this morning.
so thankful that we serve a good God that has our best interests in mind, that no matter what it is that we come in contact with, no matter what happens in our life, we can trust the fact that he is doing these things and allowing them because he loves us and he's bringing about a greater good in our life. You know, the Bible says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this morning, in just a moment, we're going to serve communion. And so I want you to be ready for that. But I want you to be thinking about and praying about as a family and with those that you've gathered with this morning. What good is it that God is trying to bring about in your life? How is it that he's trying to deepen the love that you have for him so that you can understand the deep love that he has for you? I want you to just spend some time this morning praying, asking God to show you some things in your life, examining your own heart, asking him to show you where you are in your faith and in your walk with him. Is there something you need to confess to him this morning? Is there something he's been asking you to do and you've been hesitant to do that? Or maybe you're just frustrated because you've been cooped up too long and you need him to remind you that he's still working. He's still in control of everything that's going on in your life and in this world. So I'm going to pray and then the worship team is going to lead us some more. And then I'll come back in just a moment and take these elements with you. Bow your heads with me. Lord, thank you for this day. It has been a good day. Because it's been a day that we're spending in your presence. And Lord, I'm praying for the families and anyone that's watching us today online. I'm asking God that you would work in their lives right there where they're watching from. I'm praying that you would bring about the good that you want to bring about for the purpose that you're calling us to. We love you and we trust you today with everything that's going on in our lives because we know that you are good. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Spend some time talking with him this morning as we continue to worship. You may say, Pastor Charles, how can you sing about God's goodness when everything is falling apart? But I want to tell you that in the midst of it falling apart, our God is still a good God. He's still a way maker. He's going to turn this thing around for the church's good. How many can believe that with me? And let's sing that chorus one more time and say, say, you're never going to let, you're never going to let.
On that last night when Jesus was, was with his disciples, he was preparing them for the perfect plan that he had in place, where he was going to accomplish his purpose for leaving heaven and coming to earth and for dying on the cross for their sins and my sins and your sins. And so he told them as he broke the bread and took the cup, he said, this is my body being broken for you. And this cup is to signify my blood being shed for you on the cross. And they didn't understand what that meant at the time. But they would come to know later on that he was talking about the ultimate sacrifice he was about to make for them. And he said that every time we take these elements together, every time we take the bread and the cup together, we're to do that in remembrance of him. And so as you take the bread this morning and drink the cup, I want you to do it remembering what Jesus has done for you. Lord, we can't begin to thank you enough for the things that you've done for us. But the most important thing you did was that you died on the cross for us so that we can have eternal life one day and have life abundantly right now. So that we can leave the things that we used to do and start living the life that you have us to live now. And so I'm praying that today, people would make that decision to trust you, to understand your love in a fresh new way. Because they've seen it played out with your arms outstretched on the cross with your body being broken for us and your blood being shed for us. Thank you for that. And thank you for the good that you're bringing about in our lives. And we place our lives in your hands and ask for it in Jesus' name. Good morning, High Point. This is a person formerly known as Jordan Barker. My name is Bubba Baker, and this is Life at HPC. On May 3rd, from 11.30 to 1.30, at the High Point Church parking lot, we're gonna be doing what we call a reverse giveaway. You can come in, you can donate some canned goods, and then we're going to take them and we're going to donate them to the Lake Wells Care Center. If your information is not in our database, you can find a link to get there via the stream here. In the description, there's a link. You can click it. It'll take you there. You can fill it out. Or you can go to our website. You'll find it there. Click it. Fill out the digital connection card. And give us your information. During this time, there's four ways that you can give your offers and tithes to the church. The very first is on our website. The second is on our app. The third, you can text this number. 207-859-9405. Text HPCLW and you'll see a link there. The fourth is you can mail it to us at 1417 Resmondo Drive, Lake Wales, Florida. 338-53. That is right, right? <laughs> On Wednesday, April 29th, we're going to have a virtual town hall meeting. This can be with Pastor Jack and Pastor Bonnie Barker. They're going to be taking your questions and updating us on what our new church building is going to be look like. So if you have any questions about that, you can email bonnie at highpointlw.com and we'll collect all those questions and answer them on Wednesday. Now, in case if you're like me and you forget some things, we're going to show you what our church is fixing to look like. Here it is. We believe that God is calling High Point Church into a big and new future. And when I look at the scripture, I realize that most of the time when God calls us to a new place, He gives us pictures, but He doesn't give us plans. And you know what? We just felt like we'd like to spend some time inviting you to walk with us through some pictures of the possible future God has for us. 
As you walk up to the front door, you're going to see people that love you and are glad you're there and they're going to welcome you and they're going to open the door for you and it'll make you feel like you're right at home. That High Point Church is your church to belong to. That every time you come, you're going to meet people that love you and love God and spend time with you and connect with you and hear your heart about what God's doing and why He brought you there. I am so excited about the lobby in our new building. I'm excited about the Missions Cafe because I don't just see it as a place to come and have some awesome coffee or a fresh donut, but I see it as a place for people to come and realize their mission, their dreams, and how they can connect to this community. Whatever God's created you to do here, whatever your purpose is, we want you to be doing that for Him. In our community, we want you to be using those God-given gifts in an area that you're passionate about to reach other people for Him. We want to be a church that connects people with their mission. We also want to be the place where kids want to be, the kids are excited to go to, that when they turn that corner and they see the area that, that's built specifically for them, that they get excited about that. And so we feel like that fosters an environment where we can really engage them and teach them about Jesus. We want to be the place where parents can bring their kids, just not on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week, to have an experience and be able to play in, in, in a godly environment. The Family Church in Lake Wales, where if you have kids from ages 0 to 18, everybody says, man, you got to go to High Point. They have it going on there, and they are all about Jesus and our community. We know in our culture, our, our students, our youth of today are, are not bombarded every day by messages of life transformation in Jesus. And so uh, with God's help, we can turn this around in this community. An oasis is a spot in the desert where water can be found. And we know that in this situation that our students can be fed life and they can be fed truth, and, uh, and we'll see real life change through that. The heartbeat of every church is the word and worship, and that's what's gonna happen in the ministry center. And when I lay with my eyes closed and try and picture in my mind what would happen as we walk into this ministry center, obviously there are a lot of things that will make an initial impression on someone, but in the end, what I dream about is people encountering the living God in this worship center. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. It's our, our reasonable thing to do. High Point will be a place where the Spirit of God dwells in His people. People who we've never met before who decided to visit this place because a new building is here, and instead of just meeting us, they met the living God and they found their purpose and they heard their calling and they're out blessing and changing their communities because here they heard the word of God, they worshiped the living God and they met him personally. I hope that happens over and over again throughout the years and that thousands of lives are changed. And ultimately we wanna be a church that focuses on what Jesus said was the greatest thing in all of the law. Loving God with everything that we have, loving other people as we love ourselves. I think that's a great thing to give your life to and we think that's worth going all in on together. Well, I want to say a happy Sunday morning to all of you who are watching us again online, who have joined us online. We're glad that you've chosen to do that. I want to say hello to all of you in Lake Wales and Babson Park and Frostproof, Dundee, Winter Haven, Haines City. But also hi to all of you in places like Indiana and Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania and New York and Kentucky. It's fascinating that so many are watching us from other states. I think we had viewers from 13 or 14 states last week and, it, and we're glad that um, you're being blessed by this live or this Facebook broadcast, and I hope you enjoy today. Uh, by the way, also remember, like was shared in announcements, if you want to fill out one of those online connection cards and communicate with us, if you've made a decision or you have a prayer request or you'd like some information, I want to encourage you to do that before you finish your time with us today. 
And please do mark April the 29th, this coming Wednesday, down. Uh, Pastor Bonnie and I are going to be doing that live town hall meeting um, so that we can bring you up to date on what's happening in, with our new building and answer some questions. And you can even send questions in advance to us via email. And uh, we can be prepared with those answers, but we'll try and interact with you live as well. If you got a Bible at, at, there at your house and you want to follow along, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where we started last week, and I want to read the first four verses with you, but we're going to concentrate on the fourth verse. But starting at verse one, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Last century, century before last, a man named Lewis Carroll wrote a book called Through the Looking Glass. It's a classic. If you're a Disney fan, you know it as Alice in Wonderland. And there is a scene there where Alice is having an argument with Humpty Dumpty over the way that he uses words. And he gets indignant with her and he says, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, that passage from a children's book has been debated by philosophers and linguists ever since it was written. But you don't have to be either one of those things to understand why it's important. Just travel to Central America and try to find a restroom if you can't speak Spanish, and you will understand how important knowing the exact word is in a situation. Or read back in the book of Genesis, the 11th chapter, when all of humanity spoke the same language and they got together and decided that they would build a tower that reached up to heaven, and God saw what they were doing and was displeased with it. When God wanted to stop them, he didn't knock the tower down or strike the people with plagues. He just said... Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. If we can't communicate, if we can't understand one another, we can't build or bless anything. So what's the problem? The problem is that words get misused and, and, and abused all of the time. They get stretched out of shape in our culture all of the time. We tend to handle words carelessly. We find a word that we like and We just start using that word for everything. It's kind of like using a butter knife to tighten a screw. It works, but it dulls the knife and it ruins the screw. And one example of a way that we misuse a word or one word that gets misused so often is the word love. Think about it. Think about how often you throw that word around. I mean, here we love the United States of America. We love ice cream. We love your nail polish. We love barbecue. We love all of those things. I remember when I was in um, fourth grade in Ohio, it was the first time I ever got to go to a Major League Baseball game. I got to go watch the Cincinnati Reds play live at Riverfront Stadium, the Big Red Machine. And I was there with my dad and a family of friends that had invited us, the Andrican family, and one of my best friends, Billy Andrican. And somewhere during that game, obviously it's obligatory that you have a hot dog at a baseball game. And so we bought a hot dog and it was the best hot dog I had ever eaten. And so in the middle of it, I I blurted out, man, I love this hot dog. And my friend Billy said, if you love it, why don't you marry it? Stupid Billy. But he was onto something. You really can't love hot dogs. And if you really do love hot dogs, you really need to go see a counselor. And maybe it seems like I'm a little overworked up about this, but here's why it matters. There is a psychological phenomenon with, that's named semantic satiation. What it's describing is the effect that's produced upon us when we hear a word repeated over and over again in rapid succession, that the word actually becomes nonsense to us. It loses its meaning. I think some, th- something similar happens when we hear a word misused over a longer period of time. Words that were once profound and precious start to lose their luster. One author has said words that at one time had juice in them now become dry and threadbare. They turn into just cliches. And, and when a word is so critical that Paul says, 
If you don't have it, you're nothing but a noise-making glory seeker or a know-it-all and your faith is useless, then we had better be careful that we don't let that happen to that word. And Paul said that about love. Without love, our faith is useless. We heard that last week when we started this series called All You Need Is Love and talked about it in the first message. And Paul showed us that love is preeminent and love is what makes everything meaningful and matter in what we do in this world. And so having shown us how critical love is, Paul now begins to launch into an explanation of love. And he doesn't use a definition. He uses a description, lots of descriptions. Descriptions of what love is and what love isn't and what love always does and what love never does. He uses positives and negatives. And by the way, those are both important. Love involves both. If you ever truly understand love, you will never buy into this modern idea of tolerance that passes for love. True love, there are some things that true love will never tolerate. And so Paul uses both positives and negatives to help us understand what true love is. But this morning, we're going to start with the positives that he lists for us. He says in verse 4, love is patient and love is kind. Just list two. And I don't know if that surprises you. It does me a little bit because I thought it would be more complicated than that. I, I, I thought it would be a little bit more involved. There would be more words to help us understand this critical word. But even while they're not complicated, they are incredibly challenging if you understand them because they remind us of two things at least that love requires of us. The first thing is love requires other people. Now we said this, but we need to spend more time on it. Love requires other people. Here's what Paul says. Love is patient. Don't you hate it that Paul starts with that one? Love is patient. I read that and I'm thinking... Yeah, yeah, hurry up, let's get to the good stuff. Yeah, I got it, love is patient, let's get to the good stuff. I mean, we went past all of these dramatic gifts like prophecy and tongues, and that wasn't it, and so you walked us past all of the deep mysteries and knowledge of the faith, and we didn't stop there, and then you had us peruse all of these life-giving, sacrificial service things, and, and we passed by that, and you told us there was still a most excellent way, there was something better, and having all of that stuff that we went by and hearing that there was something better than that, I could not wait for you to pull back the, the curtain and let me see that. And when you pull it back, this is what I get. Patient. Love is patience. Patience is dull. Patience is sedentary. Patience is, patience is for people who don't have more important things to do. I'm sorry, folks, we've, we've been sheltering in place for a little while now, and after being cut off and cut off and cooped up, the last thing I want to hear is love is patient. I bet you didn't want to hear it either. But here's the truth. Our struggle with patience didn't start with this government lockdown. Patience has always been a problem for us. It's always been difficult, and it's, it's more difficult now in the age that we're living in than it has ever been before. Technology and our pace of life continue to accelerate. Really, think about this. We have always had food, but it wasn't until the last 50 years that we invented something called fast food. For the first time, we started getting food, not because it tasted good or it was healthy. The one reason we buy it is it's fast. And I'm old enough to remember that even when we had our first fast food restaurants, you still had to go inside to a counter to get the food and eat the food. But then that wasn't fast enough, so we invented drive through So you can eat your dinner in the minivan on the way to Little League practice or soccer, soccer practice or dance practice the way that God intended for us to enjoy our dinners. And now we can even order ahead and have it waiting for us when we pull up. And God, please give protection to the poor person who has to try and stay out of our way and avoid getting run over while we're picking up our food. We invented not just dating, but speed dating, self-checkout, overnight shipping, instant messaging. And by the way, we don't call it instant messaging. We call it IMing because spelling the whole phrase takes too long. We jam phrases all of the time into a few letters, BTW, that means, by the way, ASAP, LOL, ROTFL, YPBTWALO, that means you're preaching better than we're letting on, in case you want to type that in the comment section while you're listening to me today, that's what that means. I'll give you a minute. But listen, listen, we call these time-saving innovations 
but in reality, they're people avoiding innovations. The more we can do without having to deal with people, the more we can say without having to actually talk to a person in person, the better. So, social distancing was already happening before the coronavirus. We were just doing it on our own terms. And we did it because people require patience. Relationships to people, how we treat one another, is exactly what Paul had in mind when he said, love is patient. We use the word patience for a lot of things. Uh, we use it when we think we've shown patience if we drive down Scenic Highway behind someone that's doing 15 miles per hour under the speed limit and we don't blow our horn, lose our, lose our control and tailgate and scream at them. We think that we've been patient. We see patience as not saying the words that come to our mind with that little spinny wheel thing appears on your computer screen and you can't go forward on the project you've been working on. We see patience as sticking with a project, finishing a task, waiting in line at Walmart when there are 20 checkout lanes and only three of them are open. We call that kind of thing patience. But that's not what Paul had in mind here. In verse seven of the 13th chapter, he uses the word perseverance. That, that has more to do with sticking it out through difficult circumstances and challenges. However, the word that he uses here for patience is different. If you want to read it in the King James Version, it says this, love suffers long. The King James Version calls patience long-suffering. And what that means is when you've put up with everything you, can th you think you can put up with, when you've suffered all you think you can suffer, suffer longer. That's what patience is. And it refers specifically to the stuff that you have to suffer with because you're hanging around with people. Perseverance is about situations. Patience is about people. It's about, and, and that only makes sense. I mean, remember, we said last week, and, and I remind you often, that the goal of our faith, the goal of our faith, the purpose of God in our lives is to make us look like Jesus. That's what this is all about. He wants to produce in each one of us, the character of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts, he wants us to become people who look like Jesus. So if God wants to grow patience in us, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, that, that's one of the characteristics of Jesus. If he wants to grow patience in us, how's he gonna do it? I was reading, um, again, another pastor this last week, and he was talking about the silver-lipped pearl oyster. You guys know oysters produce pearls, or at least this kind does. It's called the silver-lipped pearl oyster. And uh, one of these, these specific kinds of oysters actually produced a pearl that sold for $1.5 million. Now the question is, how, how does an oyster produce a pearl? What's needed for that to happen? Well, in order for an oyster to produce a pearl, it has to have three things, an irritant, time, and self-sacrifice. Those three things are required to produce this treasure inside of an oyster. Once an irritant, that could be a grain of sand or anything, gets placed into the pearl, it has to cope with that irritation. And the way the pearl or the oyster copes with that irritation is it begins to give a little bit of itself to the irritant. It secretes the same substance that its shell is made of around that irritant. It wraps it around in layer after layer. It gives some of itself to the irritant. Layer after layer, over years, it creates this lustrous pearl. And that process takes a long time. It can take 20 years for an oyster pr to produce one pearl. So in the lifetime of an oyster, maybe two get produced. And I would tell you, I bring it up because to produce patience, to produce the character of Jesus in your life, the same three things are required. An irritant, time, and sacrifice, self-sacrifice. An irritant, time, and self-sacrifice. Now, God will give every one of us the first two. God will give you the first two, an irritant and time. He will allow you to spend time around something or someone specifically that irritates you. Many of you are sitting at home with your irritant right now. Don't look at them, don't smile, don't even acknowledge this. But in your head, you know I'm talking and you know who your irritant is. And by the way, if you don't have an irritant, call the church office, we will assign you one from our database. But God will give you an irritant. And that is how it happens. No other way. This is another reason that your faith has to be engaged in a community. 
So whenever somebody says, man, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church because the church is so full of hypocrites and the church is so full of selfish and judgmental people, exactly. That's why you need to come to church. You need us. And by the way, we need you with all of your hypocrisy and all of your self-righteousness and all of your judgmentalism. We need you with all of your junk, all of us spending time together and irritating one another is the only way we learn how to love people. But it doesn't happen automatically. Like I said, God will provide two of the three. He'll give you the irritant and he'll give you the time, but you have to make the decision about self-sacrifice. So that brings us to the second truth about love that these virtues make us aware of. Love requires self-sacrifice. Love is patient and love is kind. Here's the question. Will you give yourself to that? Will you be self-sacrificing? Will my response to all of the time that I have to spend with all of these irritating people be patience and kindness? Now, before you commit, before you do the church thing, and say, well, sure, I'll be patient and kind. You need to grasp that those two words mean, what those two words mean, exactly what response is God demanding from us when he points out that love is patient and kind? And again, I say this because patience and kindness are nice words. They sound like grandma and grandpa words. So to understand when Paul, understand when Paul lists patience and kindness, he isn't asking us to be Boy Scouts. He isn't asking us to be nice. Paul is recruiting us to a determined, fierce, heartbreaking, no holds barred, never turn around way of loving people. He's asking us to love people the way Jesus does. He's asking us to love people if it, even if it means that we have to take up our cross to love them. That is the way of life that's captured in those words, patient and kind. It's two sides of the same coin. They're two distinct sides, but it's the same coin. And patience and kindness are the currency that God uses to buy human hearts. That's why he demands it out of us. So so I'm not gonna neatly separate the two. We're not gonna deal with them in little boxes. I'm just gonna work through how they each behave. And though one may take the lead in different circumstances, these are the general truths about love that is patient and kind. That kind of love takes the initiative in people's lives. Love is kind. Love is kind. That's just what love is. Love doesn't respond to the environment. Uh, we We don't look for nice places. We don't look for nice schools. We don't, we don't look for nice neighborhoods and join them. That's not the way love behaves. We are patient and kind, and we carry that patience and kindness into churches and into neighborhoods and into schools. We are infected with this and contagious, and we don't isolate ourselves from selfish and sinful environments. We go to those places, and we try to infect them and start a pandemic of people loving God and loving one another. Love is kind. Love doesn't wait for that kindness to be earned or deserved. It just is kind. That's why the King James Version translates the word love, charity. Charity is something we give to people who don't deserve it and they can't earn it. So love is kind to people who don't deserve kindness and patient with people who don't deserve patience. Love is not distant or disengaged. It is outgoing. It is personal. It insinuates itself into the lives of other people. We get involved in their sin and their selfishness and their suffering. Love takes the initiative with people. And so love is always looking for opportunities. One of my favorite episodes in the Old Testament is from the life of King David. You know the story of how King, how, how God anointed David to be king while Saul was still on the throne. And, and David suffered all kinds of indignities because of Saul's jealousy. Saul tried to kill him, ran him away from his home, took his wife away from him. And, but now there reaches this point where Saul has died and David has ascended to the throne of Israel. And shortly after he becomes king, he's with his advisors. And in the ninth chapter of, of 2 Samuel, it says, David asked, is there anyone to whom I can show kindness? Anyone in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? 
And so they begin to look for some, survival from the, some survivor from the household of Saul. And after a long search, they find in a desert town called Lodabar, Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, crippled and fearful and hiding from the king. And when they find him, they summon him to Jerusalem. He thinks he's going there to be executed before David. But when he appears before David, David says, don't be afraid. I am going to show you kindness for Jonathan's sake. And so he restores all of, Mephib- all of Jonathan, his father's land, and Mephibosheth and invites him to eat day after day at the king's table. Folks, David didn't have to do that. In fact, that was the last thing that anyone would have expected David to do as the king of Israel. But he wanted to honor his friend Jonathan. And he wanted to heal a wound, that a, a split that had taken place between the families. So he didn't wait for an opportunity. He looked for an opportunity. Is there anyone left that I can show kindness to? That's how love behaves. We want to honor Christ. We want to try in some way to heal the divide that exists between people and their God. We want people who are running and hiding from a God they think is out to get them to come back and receive his love and sit down with us at the family table and enjoy fellowship with us. So we look for chances. We look for opportunities to show kindness. We, we look for that opportunity. Now think about what I'm saying here, folks. About a couple of decades ago, this thing got real popular in our culture of doing random acts of kindness. And I'm not knocking that. I mean, it's better than random acts of violence, but this, it became popular for people to do random acts of kindness. And I applaud the notion, but here's what I want you to understand. Christian love is not random. There's nothing random about the love that Christ asks us to show. Love is intentional. Love has kindness on its to-do list. Have you thought about that? Imagine, imagine how your life would change and how exciting it would be. And imagine how it would impact your family. If you sat down together, maybe once a week, and, and you ask the question around the dinner table, who can we show kindness to today? Who is it in our neighborhood? Who is it at our school or our church that we can show kindness to? And it doesn't have to be huge stuff that we do to show kindness to people, but it is going to have a huge impact. I mean, obviously it's going to have an impact on them, but more importantly, I think also it's going to have an impact on you and on your family. Love takes the initiative. Love gets involved and shows kindness on purpose. But understand this, love has to make a commitment. Random acts of kindness are cool because you can do this for people without having to get involved with those people, right? I mean, if I can, I can pay for your coffee at Dunkin' Donuts without you knowing about it and walk out, and it was fun for me to do that. But if you're a jerk, I'm done. Enjoy your coffee, jerk. I don't have to be in relationship with you after I pay for your coffee. I get the benefit of feeling good about what I've done without having to have a relationship with you. I'm a good person that buys coffee for random jerks. No commitment, no long-term contracts. I did something, done. And folks, those things, again, they're good as far as they go. But constantly remind yourself the aim of God, the function of love, real love, the function of New Testament love is to form the heart of Christ in us. So when Paul talks about intentional kindness of love, he pairs it with patience. Kind and patient, patient and kind. We're gonna have to be committed because the kindness of love is not a one-off act that we do for people. It isn't us handing money out the window to some stranger or dropping stuff off at the local thrift store. We can do those things for all of the reasons that Paul talked about in verse three. I give my body to be burned and I give all that I have to the poor so that I may boast. We can do those kind of things for all of the wrong motives. We we give like that so that we can feel better about ourselves. We give like that so we can ease our conscience that we have so much and they have so little. little. We can give like that because we just got to get junk cleaned out of our garage. But the kindness of love that love seeks to build or seeks to do in our lives gets us to build relationships because it's aimed at restoring relationships with God. The kindness of love makes, makes a commitment to the same person the same family, the same neighborhood, the same congregation, the same husband or wife, the same community over 
a long haul. That kind of love says, I'm gonna stay here with you. I'm gonna be committed to you. I'm gonna walk with you. I'm gonna be in relationship with you. I'm gonna get to know you. I'm gonna invest in you. I'm gonna keep coming back to you. I'm gonna keep pouring into you. So you gotta be patient with your kindness. And patience means you gotta be willing to sacrifice. Sacrifice your pace. You can't be in a hurry with love. People don't get sanctified on your schedule. Now, I like that, so I'm going to say it again. People don't get sanctified on your schedule. Nobody gets holy in a hurry. Jesus modeled this. I mean, look at the people he invested in. And I know they're apostles and everything, and we're, we're supposed to respect them, but, but they were a mess when Jesus chose them. None of them had a good resume. All of them had their own selfish agendas. They were prejudiced and hot-headed. And, and Jesus was trying to show them the kingdom of God. And he spent three years with them, day and night, teaching them and modeling for them the kingdom of God, trying to reach them. And in the end, in the last days that he spent with them, he still, in John 16, had to say, I have so much more to say to you, but more than you can bear now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. How frustrating this has to be. How maddening this has to be for Jesus. Basically, what he's saying is, even after three years of night and day modeling of the kingdoms, you are not getting this. But I know you'll finally get it when the Holy Spirit gets here. Even Jesus knew some things, no matter how kind you are, will never change in people until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them. So, if you're gonna love people, you gotta decide you're gonna be patient with them. You can't quit you can't walk away. If you want the marriage of your dreams, if you want the church of your dreams, if you want the city of your dreams, you gotta be willing to live through some nightmares and stay with people in those times. You're also gonna have to sacrifice your expectations. The kindness of love is an I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine kind of proposition. Jesus said in Luke chapter six, love your enemies. And do good to them and lend to them without expecting it anything back. So much about us has to be nailed to the cross in order for us to live like this. Your idea of what you deserve, your idea of justice and fairness. You must understand that because this kind of kindness is often going to be misunderstood and rejected when you try and show it to people. The response of a wicked and selfish and fallen world to love will often be unkind and misunderstanding and brutal. Love is what got Jesus nailed to the cross, folks. You may give to someone and be taken advantage of. You may sacrifice and have your motives misunderstood and be the victim of accusation. You may stand up for the right or for someone in the right and lose your job. You may risk telling the truth and be hated by someone because you took the risk. So if you decide to show the kindness of, and the kindness of love to this world, you gotta leave your invoices and your expectations nailed to the cross. You gotta sacrifice your expectations. It's a demanding way of life, but it is the most excellent way. And here's why. Jesus finishes in Luke 6, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting anything in return. Then your reward will be great. Well, what's the reward? What's this great reward? Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he's kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. That's the reward. That's the payoff of love that is patient and kind. We become children of our father. Now, here's what that means. I'm, 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 I turn 50 a few years back now. And uh, when I, anytime I go home to visit folks uh, at home, people will, somebody inevitably will say, man, there is no doubt you are Bill Hillegoss' son. The further down the road I get, the more I look like him, the more I talk like him, the more obvious it becomes that I'm his child. That's what Jesus is getting at. When you can live like this, you become children of your father. The more we love, the more we show kindness, the longer we are patient in that kindness, the more definite it becomes you are children of your merciful, patient father. And by the way, if you're watching this this morning and you didn't know it, 
Maybe this is a surprise to you, but God is a merciful father. He chose to show you kindness when you didn't know him. When you didn't love him, he loved you. This is the merciful father that sent his son Jesus who died on a cross for you to pay a debt that you could never pay and give you a gift that you could never earn or deserve, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. This is a merciful father who's sending the Holy Spirit to search for you even while you're running from him because he wants you to come back to the family. He wants you to sit at the table with us. He wants you to know it's okay for you to dangle your dirty feet under the table with all of the rest of us. He wants you to know that your sins can be forgiven and your eternal life has been paid for. It's an amazing thing when you think about it, how patient he is calling and waiting on you because he doesn't want you to perish. And he's ready for you this morning. He's ready for you to come back and be his child. I hope you'll take him up on the offer. Why don't y'all pray with me? Father, we bless you. None of us deserved your kindness, not a single one. You have opened up the windows of heaven and poured out on us blessings so much beyond what we deserve. And our prayer is this morning that one more time you might take our breath away as we realize how good you've been to us and that that realization might humble us enough to wanna be patient and kind to people around us. Everybody has a story, Lord. We have to be patient enough to love them, whatever their story is, so that we might, by doing that, bring them back to you. And my prayer this day, God, is that your spirit might have gone out in every living room or through every computer screen of folks who are worshiping with us. And if there is that one soul out there that's running from you because they're scared to death of your justice, that today your love and mercy might draw them back to yourself. We pray it in the name of Jesus, amen. Our pastor's been talking about love, and we're in this series that's talking about love, and right now, I feel like our world needs to know that it's all about his love, what he did for us. And so this song, I felt it would be befitting to end our service with this song. Sing along if you know it. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Ooh, yeah. Falling in love with Jesus was the best thing I had ever done. Falling in love with Jesus Falling in love with Jesus oh. Falling in love with Jesus Is the best thing I've ever done In his arms, and in his arms, I feel protected. In his arms, in his arms, never disconnected. In his arms, I feel protected. There is no place I'd rather be. Say falling. falling in love with Jesus. Falling, falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. Come on. Sing if you feel the same way. In his arms, in his arms, I feel protected. In 
in his arms, in his arms, never disconnected. Oh, in his arms, I feel protected. There's no place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. One more time, yes, there, there is no, no place, place I'd rather, rather be. God bless you today. We love you.